Welcome to the National Archives and Records Administration's 2024 Genealogy Series. My name is Erin Townsend, and I am the coordinator for this year's program. We are so happy you've joined us. Every year, the National Archives hosts the Genealogy Series, a free educational genealogy event broadcast on YouTube. Our presenters are records experts from National Archives locations across the United States. The sessions offer family history research tools on federal records and are open to everyone, from beginners to experienced family historians. All are welcome. We invite you to join the conversation. During each session's premiere, you can participate with the presenters and other family historians via live chat. Ask questions and get the presenter's answers anytime throughout the video and for an additional 10 minutes after the presentation ends. Here's how to engage in the live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch chat because the speaker will answer your questions there. Type your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Please keep your questions on today's topic. We are offering five genealogy sessions on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, starting May 21st and ending June 25th. We will not have a session on June 11th. If you miss a premiere broadcast, please know that videos and handouts remain available online after the event, where you can view them at your convenience. Welcome to today's presentation entitled After Their Service, Tracing the Lives of Native American Scouts. Our presenter is Cody White. Cody is an archivist at the National Archives at Denver and a subject matter expert for Native American related records. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and a Master of Library and Information Science from UCLA. He has been with the National Archives since 2012. Welcome, Cody. Thank you for your presentation today. Well, hello there. My name is Cody and I'm talking to you from the National Archives at Denver, the only National Archives facility in the mountain time zone at an elevation of 5,280 feet here in the Mile High City. We have a jam-packed talk today, lots of original records to share from across the nation to tell a tale, a tale of Native American genealogy. Thank you all for listening as we premiere this live today or in the future if you have come across this talk online. So quick, a funny story. My son, eight years old, for a career, he doesn't want to be a fireman, a doctor, an archivist. He says he wants to be a YouTuber. So the other night I pointed out that I, in fact, was sort of a YouTuber with these talks, to which we then had to look them up and he promptly noted how low the views and likes were. Thank you for that, Dean. But he did give me some advice. So if you genuinely enjoy this talk and those like it, from myself and my great colleagues, subscribe to the National Archives channel so you don't miss any of our great historical content. Oh, and, uh, and push like. No, no, no. Hit, hit like. Nah, I, I can't keep this jargon straight. Anyways, on with the show. This is Harry Moccasin Crow, born in 1853-1854. This photograph was taken around 1909 and comes from our U.S. Army Historical Photograph Collection. It was part of Joseph Dixon's book, The Vanishing Race, that documented many notable Native oral histories along with photographs. In part of it, he reunited four of the then living Custer Scouts and documented their recollections. Using National Archives holdings, it is Harry Moccasin's story we will tell today as a case study of sorts for the sort of genealogical history one can compile on any of the native scouts of the late 19th century. So for context, natives have assisted armies as military scouts long before we were even a country, and then following the creation of the United States. In 1866, Congress passed a law allowing for uniformed native scouts, which is where today's talk begins specifically the late 19th century Indian Wars west of the Mississippi. Now, Indian Wars wasn't a nebulous term. The Army considered these series of conflicts that dated back even before the Revolution as war and with designated campaigns within, which came into play decades later when Army pension laws were passed. So men from a host of tribes enlisted as U.S. Army scouts. 
the government exploiting traditional rivalries between warring tribal nations. But for those who joined, I, I mean, the end result, it didn't help as every tribe still largely suffered from disposition and, and poverty. So here is a close-up of that map that I just showed that highlighted the breadth of campaigns and U.S. Army installations across the West. Harry Moccasin's service centered around the Crow Reservation, which is alongside where Little Bighorn is noted on here. His six months of service was in those battles, Rosebud, Little Bighorn, and he continued moving west to Fort Shaw and Fort Ellis, where he was discharged from. So why did Harry Moccasin sign up? Without his ever saying, one cannot be sure, but one such rivalry I touched on earlier was between the Lakota and the Crow. The Crow had aligned themselves with the white invaders against their traditional enemy, the Lakota, the bands who had tormented them and pushed them off territory. So during General Crook's 76th campaign against the Lakota and Cheyenne, he had no issues getting Crow men to join up as scouts. In this excerpt from our holdings, we see the Crow Indian agents opening an 1876 letter to the Indian Affairs Commissioner that the Crow warriors have gone en masse to assist in the campaign against the Sioux. Harry Moccasin was part of this effort. And his service started on April 10th, 1876, when he enlisted into the U.S. Army at the Crow Indian Agent. On this slide, we see the enlistment records as saved, this coming from a series at our Washington, D.C. location of Indian Scout enlistments. Uh, an interesting side note, we later learn in the records we talk about today, Little Face, Harry Moccasin's father, also enlisted that day, and his papers are also present in this collection. They, uh, nor these ones here, note the family connection. We only learn this from the much later pension file we'll talk about at the end. Since we have a whole life to talk about today, I won't belabor the events of June 1876 as gallons of ink have been spilled on Custer's last stand over the past 150 years. And there are so many essays and monographs that slavishly detail the military story. General Cook's overall force had hundreds of Crow, Shoshone, Arikara on hand as scouts. But as Lieutenant Custer moved closer to his fate, only a handful of scouts remained with his detachment. Several, including Harry Moccasin and White Man Runs Him, were sent away by Custer before the battle. Again, we have another photograph from Joseph Dixon's book found in our holdings. This one here of the then living scouts posing at the battlefield site. Um, in this text at 13 here of White Man Runs Him Recollections, he refutes that they were AWOL after the battle. In the Army records, Harry Moxon was noted as AWOL from the day of the battle until July 15th. But even if true, it seems understandable given the command had been wiped out. He was noted as being back with General Terry's column from July 15th to August 20th. Then he was put on detached service until September 30th at his home, Fort Shaw, and Fort Ellis, the latter where he was discharged on September 30th. He had over 30 days in the zone of the Northern Cheyenne and Sioux campaign in Montana Territory, 1876, which will come into play later. Again, all these old army records are held at our Washington DC location, and that includes the various series that are great for researching native scout service. The current branch chief there, Trevor Plant, wrote this essay for our prologue magazine back in 2009, and it is an excellent resource for explaining the enlistment records, muster rolls, medical records, Medal of Honor records, several Native Scouts were awarded the nation's highest honor, and he touches on pension files, which we will later today as well. The catch is Harry Moccasin's service was short just one six month enlistment. And unlike some other scouts, he never signed back up again, which leads us then back to the reservation. The initial massive Crow reservation, Crow territory, was first established in the sprawling 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, but by 1868, it began to shrink as 30 million acres were ceded. What we see here in this 1874 map is an accurate anymore either. Further land sessions in 82, 92, and 1904 dropped the overall size to 2.4 million acres. But 
This is where Harry Moccasin returned to after his scout service and where he would live for the rest of his life. Which brings us to Record Group 75, records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs holdings here at the National Archives at Denver, which holds records of all native reservations in Montana, along with the entire Mountain West. This card of records seen here that held mentions of Harry Moccasin are only a tiny fraction of the nearly 400 cubic feet of Crow Indian Agency records we hold. Also on this slide, we see the combined National Archives at Denver and the Denver Federal Records Center facility, built on what might have been considered empty land back in 2011, but it was never empty. It had been traversed by Cheyenne, Arapaho, Lakota, Ute, Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, Shoshone, among many others over the centuries, and was the site of trading, hunting, gathering, and healing. In 1851, that treaty at Fort Laramie formally recognized most of the front range of the Rocky Mountains in present-day Colorado as Arapaho and Cheyenne territory. But as was the case throughout the West, gold was soon discovered and both lost yet more territory through new treaties and outright abrogation of others as more and more people moved into the area. So we do acknowledge that history of the land where we today work. Our first mention of Harry Moccasin appears in 1886 in a reservation census. In 1884, a federal law was passed directing Indian agents to conduct an annual census on each reservation. And this was followed by an 1885 Indian Affairs Commissioner Directive detailing the process. These became the famous M595 microfilm series, Indian Census Rolls 1885 to 1940, available on all major genealogy websites. Now, interestingly enough, that series of census forms sent into the BIA headquarters only starts with the Crow in 1891. So this particular volume is unique. Harry Moccasin is 33. He's married to Quick, who is 26, and they have two sons, Firehead, six, and Kills the Mud Thrower, one. Strikes the Fighter, noted as mother-in-law, is 65. Now, it appears this book was a well-used resource in the Crow Indian Agent office, for two reasons. One is that number 1834. The handwriting and ink appear the same as the name entries, so I assume they were written together. This is unique because usually in censuses, these numbers mean nothing. They are only where the person fell in the overall numbering of the census, and it would change from year to year. But this number is also Harry Moccasin's land allotment number in 1907. So given this might be the first reservation census taken, those numbers apparently were recycled in the decades after for allotment purposes. Now, we'll get into land allotments in a little bit. The other important thing to note here is the death dates that are noted up into 1901. So this volume was annotated with that information even after death registers, which we'll talk about in a bit, were introduced in 1890. Five years later, this census has the phonetic spelling of the member's native name. These sort of mentions were later priceless because his army records only had that name and not Harry Moccasin. So he later needed to prove he was one and the same. The family is all the same as in 1886. These volumes were the copies of the official censuses submitted to the commissioner that we just talked about. They are in bound volumes, but on this thin, very fragile onion skin paper. And the ink runs a bit in these copies. So add that to the cursive and it can be a historical challenge to read them. We'll be looking at each census here in the 90s because a lot happens in the family. Three years since the last slide and both Firehead and Kills the Mud Thrower are gone, with two new sons present, Bird Eggs and No Wife. Strikes the Fighter is still living with them, 73 years old. Now we saw the 1886 census annotated that the two boys were lost in 1893. Unfortunately, our agency correspondence is missing for that year, so I couldn't try to see exactly what might have happened, um, what epidemic swept through. And Frederick Hoxie's great history on the Crow only notes that from 1890 to 1893, the tribe lost many children. This, this, page, is, is, this page is hard to see. Um, I stop because when you work with history, you know, personal history like this, you, you put yourself into it at times. I'm 41. Um, the same age as Harry Moccasin here. We, we both have military service 20 years in the past at this age. I currently have two kids, eight and three. 
kills the mud thrower with eight when he lost him. I, I just, I can't imagine as I type this and look over at the family photos on my desk, you know, that, that sort of loss. In the next year, Strikes the fighter has passed away, but the rest of the family is the same. The same employee wrote this one as the 1894 one. The handwriting is the same. And since we've already figured their writing out, that is a nice break. Cursive reading, I feel it's more often like code breaking than anything else. This idea that cursive is always perfect and beautiful, it's so wrong. Often it's a mess and you have to study the text, look at it, see how they write letters and words you know for sure and then sort of back up and let your eyes fill in the writing. It's really an art. So earlier I mentioned the big census series that's in Washington, D.C., reproduced on microfilm 595, and local copies of the same that were kept. So here is an example comparing them. On the left is what you'll see in the microfilm series. The info is handwritten into an agency provided form. Then on the right is the local letterpress book copy that many agencies retained. So here we are one year later in 1896 and no wife is now missing. We unfortunately now know what that means. Now it's 1898 and we have a daughter, Mary Harry Moccasin. In some later records, she's also listed as Smart Deer and she has no phonetic native name here or in later records. Um, that's not a big surprise. In these census forms and student case files and school applications, you start to see this dropped anyways in the early 20th century, I think as part of the assimilation effort to force the use of uh, white and English names. Now, four years later, and father and son are alone. Quick is gone, as is Mary. Now, we had that notation earlier of Quick's passing, but for now, we know nothing of what happened to Mary. And it gets worse. Three years later, in 1905, Harry Moccasin is completely alone. Same for 1907. But the following year, in 1908, Strikes First appears with him as wife. We'll stop examining the censuses here. They continue on for decades. And then in 1910, reservations start showing up wholesale in the federal decennial censuses. But they all remain the same. Harry Moccasin and Strikes First. So at this point, the censuses, while offering a nice framework to construct a family tree with, are not the only resource one can turn to. Around this time is another family history resource for Native reservations, the Register of Indian Families. So these were born out of a 1901 initiative to better document Native vital records, such as marriages, birth, and death for airship purposes. This was at the peak of the allotment era, where each native was given a parcel of land, a topic we'll talk about it again in a few more slides. And the Office of Indian Affairs strove to keep better track of family relationships for inheritance purposes. So registers for birth, death, marriages, and then these volumes that detailed entire families were ordered to be kept. Harry Moccasin and Strikes First don't show up in the marriage registers, so those aren't of any help in pinning down that date. But here is the family in the aforementioned family register, taken in 1902. So it is just him and Bird Eggs and Mary. Given the purpose I discussed for these, they were updated, as we see here, with the death of Bird Eggs and Mary. Now, I don't want to be that sort of professor who assigns their own writing to the class, but in this and the next slide, I do note some History Hub blogs that I wrote on these records to further explain them and how to locate them. So in tandem with the family registers I just noted, I mentioned birth and death registers. Coverage for these varies greatly by reservation. The Crow birth register doesn't start until 1900. So we have no mentions of Harry Moccasin's children. But the death register was started in 1890, so we have the full span of the family's tragedy documented. The cause of death in these is not given. It often is in sanitary reports, books on care given by agency doctors. But again, the existence of those varies, and we have none from the Crow Agency. Sanitary reports, when present, are organized only by date, so those can be hard to browse. While these volumes are indexed by name, and thereunder by date of death, so much easier to search. 
One um, here that I didn't have space for was Harry Moccasin's father, Littleface, who this register noted died at the age of 77 on September 1st, 1898. So I mentioned land allotment several times now. Let's dive into that topic. While the tragedy of the boarding school era is so often noted in pop culture and the media, the near simultaneous land allotment era kicked off by the 1887 Dawes Act was similarly devastating in its near decimation of native reservations. In short, not every res was allotted, but on those that were, a law would be passed to set it in motion, and then each tribal member was granted a parcel of land. Churches were granted parcels for schools and churches as well, land set aside for BIA uses and purposes. Then, whatever land was left over, not allotted, was often opened up for sale to non-natives. But, but the land allotted to natives wasn't fully theirs, but rather put into trust for a set amount of time. So any actions like leasing or selling thus had to have the BIA's approval. If at the end of the period or if the law was changed, they were deemed competent. That's why you see that term a lot in these records. They were granted a patent and fee, thus allowing them to sell or lease the land themselves. Allotting reservations, this was all scrapped in the 1930s during the Indian New Deal, but the damage had been largely done. Reservation land holdings resembled checkerboards, and in the hundred years since, you still have tribal nations working to buy back land to reconstitute their borders. It, it really checked all the boxes for the white colonizers. It pushed the white concept of land ownership to turn them into stationary farmers it broke up the reservations with aided further assimilation, and a bonus, it took back even more native land to give away to whites. This is all a very gross oversimplification. Entire books and talks have been done on this incredibly deep topic. But for the sake of our talk today, Harry Moccasin was right in the middle of the process. The Crow Reservation was open to allotment in the early 1900s through the 1920s. The land allotments weren't as formal as homesteading, desert land, forest land, entry processes. There wasn't a case file per se like all of those, and it was done through both the BIA and the General Land Office. Later ones did include patent grants signed by agents for the president, like a homestead. These can be found uh, via the BLM GLO search site. But by and large, these tract books, large land registers, is where they were noted. On the left is one kept by the Crow Reservation. These BIA ones were organized by township and range of the parcel, like a traditional track book, and then the allotting was noted. On the right are reservation track books kept by the General Land Office. Here they organized it by allotment number and then noted the parcels underneath. Harry Moccasin was first granted 320 acres in 1907 and later another 640 acres through the 1920 Crow Bill. Now that, that was actually sort of a half win for the tribe. You see, after the first allotment round, some began to push to open the unallotted lands to homesteading for everyone. And the Crow fought back with the help of a Washington DC attorney uh, in the Indian Bureau even itself. So Congress kept trying to take back the land, but twice it failed as tribal delegations went back and forth from Montana to the nation's capital. By World War I, a stalemate of sorts had emerged. The land was never going to be allowed to be communal, which is what the Crow wanted, but they could allot it to tribal members once again. So the result, the 1920 Crow Bill, is how Harry Moccasin got another 640 acres and then shares in tribal funds, as we will see in his will. In addition to track books, some agencies compile lists or register of allotments. The Crow do have these, which act like an index of sorts for the track books but someone at the agency also created this masterpiece, a massive three and a half foot by five foot handwritten list of all the lotties organized by allotment number. Our records here at the National Archives, you just never know how big they're gonna get. So for today's talk, I scanned this piece of a township survey plat the General Land Office drew in 1887. Now we have these for our entire Mountain West area to show you the parcels of his original allotment. The 320 acres are actually split up. There is an 80 on that one ridge east of the plains 
and then a 240 acre parcel a mile and a half east. Now this plant was drawn pre-improvements uh, for the next several decades, irrigation ditches and whatnot were put in to help with farming while other lands were used for the rich grazing. Another resource for tracking an individual and their family in the BIA records are annuity payrolls. And actually, these were also cited later in the pension file for the exact same reason, tracking Harry Moccasin's age to determine his birth year. So these records, as with so many others, are born out of a dark history, largely the treaty era, when the US bought, and I use that term in quotation marks, land from the tribes with the promises of annuities, either goods or cash payments for a set amount of time. Negotiated under duress, often with no or little understanding, so many of these represented a gross undervaluation of the land. And in some cases, the promised supplies and goods early were late or skimmed or not even given. So again, this is another topic you can explore more in depth. But here is an example from 1892 of the family all receiving their annual annuity payment, $6 each. Native employment by the BIA was very common, not only as laborers, but as policemen, farmers, teachers. In fact, Robert Yellowtail Crow in the 1930s became the first native to become a superintendent of his own reservation. So when researching any individual from that era, it doesn't hurt to look into employment records. Some agencies have more than others in their local files. Unfortunately, the Crow agency employment records are rather spotty for the dates of Harry Moccasin's life. So in reading that fellow Custer Scout Curley had been a reservation policeman, I reached out to my friends at the National Archives at St. Louis, where all official personnel files are kept to look, but nothing showed up for Harry Moccasin. More information on the requesting process can be made by reaching out to the National Archives at St. Louis. And even though I had no luck, I, I wanted to share an example of a record you might find. This is a service record card that lists where and when a person worked for the BIA. This one here is for Mary Desette, a teacher in New Mexico and in Oklahoma. So the idea of making an X instead of a signature very common in the 19th century and today in pop culture but in the early 20th century with those natives that couldn't write it was felt it wasn't definite personal or binding when signing legal documents as a result the bia switched to using a thumbprint and you see this up into the 1930s on official documents and here within our crow allotment records is a ledger of the various crow and their thumbprints here is Harry Moccasins stamped in 1912. Now, this record doesn't really advance his story at all, but it is an interesting historical artifact. Another great family history resource, one with pictures even, are the industrial surveys conducted nationwide on reservations in the 1920s. These again were born out of the allotment era. Given the drive to make natives into self-sufficient farmers, these surveys required the reservation superintendents to go door to door and note how the farming was going, what they were raising, their debt, their families, their health. Photographs were taken. Some agents took them just of the buildings, um, others of the families themselves. They are a veritable gold mine, especially when the family was photographed. Now, some agencies retained local copies, but they were intended to be sent into the BIA headquarters where at our Washington, D.C. location, the originals reside today. The Crow Reservation Survey was taken in the summer of 1922, but there was none done for Harry Moccasin. So here's an example of one taken on the Crow Reservation. And again, these can be requested from our Washington, D.C. branch. Now, I wonder if Harry Moccasin didn't have a survey taken because he had been ill that summer. On October 10, 1922, Harry Moccasin succumbed to tuberculosis. He was around 68 years old. His exact birth date in 1853, 1854 is uncertain. So it is generally known that the National Archives does not have vital records, such as birth or death certificates, because those are state level records. But here is a death certificate for him from our holdings. Look closely, this isn't a state of Montana form, but rather Department of Commerce, Bureau of the Census form. So I mentioned earlier that the BIA had long tracked births and deaths and registers, 
But in the 1920s, they began a collaboration with the Census Bureau to generate and collect such certificates. You'll see them either be the state form or these federal ones. The agent would collect the birth and death certificates, send them to the BIA headquarters, who would then turn them over to the Census Bureau for tabulation. I've never found any record that they were saved at that point. So what is left are the copies that individual agencies saved, which varies by reservation. Again, the history is foggy as to when they stopped, but you don't see them much after 1940. But usually by then, natives on reservation start showing up in state death and birth certificate collections. But even after death, the historical record continues. We talked about how the BIA was greatly concerned with airship, the passing on of land and possessions. So probate records are common, both locally in agency files and in the BIA headquarter records, where probate actions had to be approved. So here's Harry Moccasin's will, and we have some new names. Now I'm gonna jump ahead a bit and explain the ones I can based on the later pension file. So he left his original 1907 land allotment to his sister, who goes by good horse or her horse is pretty, depending on the record. In 1923, she was a widow and appears from the records his only sibling, both being the children of Little Face and Hunts the Walk. Next listed is his widow, strikes first, quarter of his second allotment, everything not noted elsewhere, and half of his tribal herd share money. Third listed is Laura Plain Left Hand. Now this is one of Strike's first daughters, so his stepdaughter. She gets a fourth of the new allotment, part of the herd money, and a bay horse. Fourth is Top of the Moccasin. He is married to another of Strike first daughter, Medicine Shell, so would be a son-in-law. He gets a fourth of the new allotment, part of the herd money, and a pinto saddle horse. Now lastly is Bright Wings, who got the last fourth of the new allotment and some herd money. This one I couldn't place. Bright Wings, near as I can tell, is another fellow close to Harry Moccasin's age, born around 1869. Uh, on the 1920 census, Bright Wings and his family lived in the 88th house, Harry Moccasin the 80th. But one does see top of the Moccasin, and Medicine's home was even closer, the 86th. So maybe that's the connection. They were neighbors. Um, I checked Bright Wings' will from 1930, and no names jump out there. So I couldn't puzzle the definite connection out. I've been mentioning Army pensions throughout today's talk, and we're finally there. Now, this is where the story really gets pulled together, in part through their own words now nearly 100 years later. What's great is that we at the National Archives have been digitizing these. Here are some shots from the Innovation Hub scanning room at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., where researchers and volunteers can scan original records. Currently, folks can come in and scan pension files, compiled military service records, bounty land application files, and carded medical records. The pension file for Harry Moccasin was one of those recently scanned, and in the past year alone, volunteers have scanned over 100,000 pages for the National Archives catalog. So like I said, it's great work. And if you're in the DC area and want to help, reach out. The, the far left image here, that is former archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, even helping out a few years back. But first, let us back up a titch to 1917. So for each conflict in the 19th century, a special law was passed granting military service pensions. So there was one for the War of 1812 vets, the Civil War vets, and as I said, what was considered the Indian Wars went on for so long, several laws were passed for veterans of various eras. In March of 1917, a law was passed granting pensions for those soldiers serving in Indian War campaigns from 1859 to 1891. And the law spelled out which campaigns, at least 30 days of service in any of them, and one was the Northern Cheyenne and Sioux Campaign, 1876 through 1877. Since Native Scouts had enlisted and were soldiers, they and their widows thus counted. In 1921, the DC law firm Binnington and Wilson was in cahoots with at least the Crow Agency superintendent to work to get the Scouts their pensions. The firm was paid $25 each for each vet they helped, and the money was paid out of trust funds and signed off by the Indian Affairs Commissioner. Here we see an agency letter noting Harry Moccasin as a scout, as well as a handwritten list the superintendent compiled of scouts, both found in the same file. 
This file comes from a massive general record series. Okay, so the BIA agencies used a host of filing codes varying by agency for many years until the standard decimal code system was put into place in the 1920s. Now with those codes, one can narrow their hunt within hundreds of boxes to zero in on military related records in the 600s with code 650 specifically for scout service. So in this case, given Harry Moccasin's service, I guessed he might be in the file. And so I took a look and found these hits, a good example of the deep dives one needs to do when researching individual natives. So today there are two ways to find these pension files. Let's start with the old way in cases where the file isn't yet scanned. If you think an individual had a pension or was entitled to one, you start with the index cards. Each era of pensions has one. So for Harry Moccasin, we would go to the most recent Indian War era. All of these microfilm index cards have been scanned and are indexed on several genealogy websites. Here is Harry Moccasin's card pulled from FamilySearch. We note two important things here. First is the certificate numbers, which are key for our staff to find the file. But also, there are two pensions. He applied for his own, and then strikes first applied for a widow's pension. So one takes this information and then makes the request. In this case, it's filed under the WC code, which stands for widow's pension. The last number used by the pension office is the number in which the pension's filed. So they're both rolled under the WC code. Now, when it comes to native scouts, finding a pension can be tricky if it was still in effect after the Bureau of Pensions was transferred from the Department of Interior to the new Veterans Administration in the 1930s. So let me show you quick. So say you wanted to find the pensions for the Custer Scouts goes ahead, who died in 1919, or White Man Runs Him, who died in 1929. As I mentioned, their pensions were rolled into the WC, the widow's pensions, and their wives live far into the 1930s. So their pensions are not in Washington, D.C., but are actually found in St. Louis with the World War I and later pension files. The cards are different, typewritten. Here we see white man runs him, and they introduced a new code, the XC code, standing for deceased veteran, which will be the number these pensions were filed under. These index cards are found in the microfilm series U.S. Veterans Administration Master Index 1917 to 1940, also found on the major genealogy websites. Now, in these cases, the request for them then must be made to St. Louis. Um, my friends there, they need the name, any aliases, date of birth or death, but most importantly, that XC file number. Actually, just send them the card if you found it. That, that's easiest. So back to Harry Moccasin's file in DC. In that case, you would use the order form NATF 85D and fill out everything you know and either mail the form or do the online request. They'll then reply if they found it or need more information. And post-Civil War pension files cost $80 for a copy. But as I said, Harry Moccasin's file was recently scanned. So before you do anything, especially the above process, you should always, always first go to our online catalog at catalog.archives.gov and type in the name. Note here, I just searched for Harry Marcus and Pension and the first result is the exact hit. That is catalog.archives.gov. I click into it and there are the 124 pages of the file there on the right. And you can click on each page to zoom in, download, or just browse. Full color, great resolution. A side note, we see here it was volunteer Ellen Russell who scanned this. So Ellen, your contribution is now part of the historical record of this talk, and we all thank you. So typically, a veteran's pension for themselves isn't too large. Their service is verified and payments start, and you don't have a, a lot of issues. With the help of that DC law firm, Harry Moccasin applied in March of 1922, but there was a problem. The army records were all under his phonetic native name, not under Harry Moccasin. So the Pension Bureau was going to need proof he was one and the same. As we've seen in today's talk, this wouldn't be hard with the Crow Agency records, but alas, he passed away that fall and thus the application was closed. Here we see some of the brief few forms of his initial application. Um, there, there's his thumbprint as we talked about a little bit ago. 
But that was merely kicking the can down the road because two years later, Strikes First applied for a widow's pension, and that was one of the two issues to arise again. Here we see a note on the far left and lower right about the name issue. And then the top right excerpt is the other problem, whether or not Strikes First was really married to Harry Moccasin. If there was no marriage record, then the Bureau was going to require at least two witnesses who could attest they were at the wedding. As it turns out, talking with friends who work in these files all the time, this is fairly common in widow pension files and is where all the genealogy gold comes from as they lay out their entire lives to prove their relationship. I have heard stories of personal letters sent in, family Bibles, all kinds of stuff. So Strikes First has to prove that Harry Moccasin was a Custer Scout and that she was married to him. This takes some time in both finding people and the records. So first off, her application was thrown out initially because she had a postmaster give her the oath and they weren't qualified apparently. So then the inspector assigned to the case was upset. They couldn't pin down Harry Moccasin's firm birth year. He had the chief clerk at the Crow Agency all the ages we have looked at throughout the censuses and annuity rolls, and, and then listed them out in this one huge form showing how the birth year would shift between 1853 and 1854. I don't know if this level of attention was typical, but the congressman from Montana, Scott Levin, took a deep interest in strike first case and again and again and again and again pestered the Pension Bureau for updates and questioned their decisions. So here we see the special congressional slip submitted to the Pension Bureau asking for updates. The investigation, it just dragged on and on, and the inspector, E.W. Young, based in St. Paul, Minnesota, decided at one point he would have to incur what he wrote were significant costs and travel in person to Montana to interview everyone. On May 11, 1926, Young was at Lodge Grass, Montana, and everyone was assembled to give their testimony some of which were those from the list of officers and comrades, the pension form that listed all fellow veterans. By this time in 1926, there was only one of the original Custer Scouts left. White man runs him, who himself was already getting a pension and provided great rich details, such as that they called the lowest white officer Pock face and they did roll call at night and Harry Moccasin was the name the whites used. He talked a bit about the battle as well, um, and Harry Moccasin's later life and wives. Thomas LaForge was another scout, a white man who had married into the Crow tribe, but was laid up in the hospital with a broken shoulder on June 9th and missed the battle. But he also attested to Harry Moccasin's service and marriage to strikes first. I know here that LaForge was white, in part because this seemed to have impressed the Pension Bureau, who perhaps racially weighed his testimony more. Strike First and her daughter, Medicine Shell, provided detailed testimony, further fleshing out their genealogy. Uh, interestingly, while they all settled on Strikes First as his last wife, the rest were a little hazy in the recollections. And thus, when placed against the historical record we've already talked about, sometimes isn't the most perfect match. Lastly, the Reverend Verbrich of St. Xavier was asked if he conducted the marriage ceremony between Harry Moccasin and Strikes First. No, he replied, but he knew them personally and knew they were married by Indian custom. Pro Superintendent C.W. Asbury possibly settled the marriage issue with his curt letter. He wrote the Bureau of Pensions that Strikes First was the only wife of Harry Moccasin at the time of his death, as determined by the Secretary of Interior in his approval of Probate 59953-23. Now, as the Pension Bureau was under the Department of Interior at this time, Asbury was basically telling them that their overall boss said Harry Moccasin and Strikes First were married. So these letters, transcripts, they're all in the file. And once everything was taken under consideration, Strikes First was granted a widow's pension, which she received until her death in 1931. In addition to her back pay from the date of his death, she also received the prorated veterans pension paid back from his death in 1922 to 1917. Here on the left, we see her application approved and then on the right, her pensioner drop form. The checks continued to arrive at the Crow Agency until a superintendent wrote the Pension Bureau of her death. 
Strength First was around 83 years old at her passing. So taking into account the various records we found, here I attempt a family tree with Strike First below. The pension had great oral histories, though they were in conflict at times. If you've done family history, this is not a big surprise as people's memories and recollections can vary. Uh, for example, also from the pension file, in the one particular form for the veteran to list wives and children, Harry Moccasin's own listing doesn't even match the record. He didn't note the son, no wife, for example. This family tree is thus a bit rough, in part because I have no real idea how to construct a complicated one of these, but I think this gives a general idea of who we discussed today. Do note it came out in several of the affidavits that Quick went by several other names, some iteration of being lucky or quick with luck, and was the younger sister of Strikes First. Now, given this came up several times, we work off the assumption for the time being that is correct. But as with any genealogy history, there are gaps, possible mistakes, and work that is never finished. But thank you for taking this journey with me today. Uh, hopefully, I've given you some rich veins to explore in regards to Native American genealogy. I used to enjoy ending my talks with the old Paul Harvey line, and that's the rest of the story. But there is probably more to the story out there and in the records, you know, just waiting to be found. So before we move on to the questions, I would just like to take a minute to give thanks and acknowledgement to some colleagues and friends who really helped me piece together today's story. Uh, Rose, Kayla, Mary, George, Anna, Catherine, and Aaron, it, it's so appreciated. And also I'd like to dedicate today's talk to Mary Frances Ronan, a reference archivist staple at our DC branch who did so much in this field, from working on inventory updates to answering each and every pesky, dumb question from a wet behind the ears archivist way out here in Denver prior to her retirement. Thank you again for watching. This ends the lecture portion of the broadcast, but we will continue to take your questions about today's topic in the chat. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email at inquire at nara.gov. Note that the videos and handouts will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. We plan future programs based on your feedback. Would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation form? At this time, I'd like to thank the Genealogy Series team who contributed to the success of this program. We are grateful for your work. If you enjoyed this video, check out our Know Your Records program. We have over 100 educational videos on how to conduct research at the National Archives. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in the chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation.